Next, we turn to the chance for some in the beleaguered U.S. prison system to be defined by more than just their crimes. A new documentary, 26.2 to Life, is going behind the barbed wire to capture the infamous San Quentin prison's running club. The California Penitentiary holds an annual marathon with participants completing 105 laps around the crowded yard. And the director, Christine Yu, as well as a member of the 1,000 Mile Club, talk with Harry Srinivasan. Christiane, thanks. Christine Yu and Markel, the gazelle. Taylor, thank you both for joining us. Christine, let me start with you. Uh, what gave you the idea to profile runners inside San Quentin in the first place? More than 20 years ago, I my relationship with the prison system started then. I had a friend who was also fellow Korean American who was wrongfully convicted in the state of California, and he was sentenced to 271 years in prison, um, knowing that basically he would be spending the rest of his living days in the prison. Um, it really, of course, impacted me deeply. And I started to wonder, you know, what does life actually look like? You know, how do you actually create a life in yeah. prison? So when I happened upon this magazine article about the marathon at San Quentin, I it immediately, for whatever reason, captured my imagination. I'm not a marathoner, but I do know that running can um, create a sense of freedom. It certainly does that for me. It solves my problems when I do yeah. that. So I thought it was like the perfect opportunity to, uh, you know, of course, a marathon being a metaphor for life in prison. All right, everybody, let's run. Start lining up. It's game time. Three, two, one, go. It's a community now. And if you can't live in a community in here, you can't live in a community out there. Why should they let me out? Because I've changed. Tell me a little bit about just the conditions of shooting a story inside San Quentin. I mean, it's a big undertaking for even the prison system to agree to this. Yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm an independent filmmaker, um, and that is exactly right. Who do you call? You know, prison is not the kind of place that you can leave a voicemail and they're going to call you back. <laughs> so, you know, when we decided to embark upon this journey, it did take about nine months just to really figure out who to, you know, the matrix of the bureaucracy, so to speak. Uh, we finally did speak with the right person, and they did grant us that permission. Um, but I will say this, that every time we shot in there, there was no guarantee that we were going to get another time to shoot. Mm. So um, time was always very limited. And over time, I mean, it took several years to do this. We, uh, you know, it was a matter of gaining trust and them knowing that I was really here to um, explore life inside um, and the human experience. Um, it wasn't necessarily like a critique on the prison system. You know, that's for people to decide on their own after they yeah. watch this. So, Markel, we should let our audience know you are have been recently released after serving 18 years. And I, I want to ask, what, what made you want to run? I mean, how did you find out about this Thousand Mile Club? Uh, as it's no secret in the film, you're kind of the fastest guy in there. What made you want to do this? Um, a friend of mine who committed suicide, who I was very close to, and the guy, I'm not going to put his name out there, but he had done like 20-some years, and this was like his fourth or fifth board hearing, and he got denied, and he hung himself. So the following year, it was my, my turn to do the same thing, go to the board and present my case so I can try to get out. And I was like, man, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to feel like that. And it's already stresses and anxieties and fears inside already. So hopefully I have a better shot. But if not, I don't want to end up like that just in case I get denied. So that's how I started running. Running opened everything up completely. And I was able to see a lot better and more clearer. I was a little bit more focused. So that allowed me to have that mental freeness before even getting released from prison. When you're running, even though you're taking turn after turn after turn inside a prison complex wall, you're surrounded by 
prisoners who are walking across the path, so to speak, not necessarily thinking about the fact that you're on your workout. What's going through your mind? First of all, I like to say that I got the idea of my purpose of running from Forrest Gump, the movie Forrest Gump, <laughs> and he ran for a purpose. So that was my thing. I wasn't envisioning I was outside. I envisioned that I was carrying everybody, including the people I victimized in my lifetime, uh, people who are struggling and suffering from their own mental prison imprisonment, um, people who, who are uh, struggling with cancer or diabetes or whatever they're struggling with and suffering with, I'm there for them to represent them and to run for them. Even people who have been victimized in their lifetime and my own personal victims and the people that I harmed and hurt, everybody I'm carrying along with me and I'm running for them. So, Christine, tell me about the difference that you had of how you perceive prison life to be, even the non-running portions versus maybe what these members of the club, these characters that you were profiling, were describing to you? I had certain perceptions of what prison and people in prison were like, uh, false impressions, really. Um, and as I got to know people moving through those spaces, I realized that you know, they're no different than any of us out here. You know, the the popular media, of course, true crime doesn't do us any favors in describing uh, what these human beings are actually like. Uh, people are more than their crimes. They are three-dimensional people with goals and dreams and families. But what I was really um, interested in the story of the Thousand Mile Club is in the face of of what seems like overwhelming systemic problems. Uh, this is a story of hope. This is a story of transformation. And really coach Frank Rona, he took his passion for long distance running, created community around that, that has had a ripple effect, you know, beyond the walls of the prison. Typically, I don't question any of the inmates uh, about their crime. It really doesn't matter much to me what they've done in the past. What matters to me is what are they doing now and what are they gonna do in the future? Christine, Mark Hale is just one of the characters that you profile. Let's talk a little bit about some of the other ones. Uh, let's start with uh, Tommy Wickard. Yes, Tommy Wickard, former uh, Nazi white supremacist gang member who has, you know, over the years, he was a serial criminal. Um, but, you know, being an Asian American female, I can definitely attest to the fact that those days are behind him. You know, and further, the data does show that as people uh, become older, they do age out of crime. But I was very interested in profiling Tommy because he his story really shows the struggles of navigating being a father and a husband from prison. And um, I'm very grateful to his family for for opening up their lives uh, to us so that we can get a peek into what those struggles really are. She's like, marry me. I was like, marry me, and I'm probably never coming home. I can understand the laws of the laws, but I have the right to be mad at my dad. No one's going to take that from me. I know he feels sorry, but tell me then, because I share my feelings. Why can't a grown man share his? To his son. So, Markel, you know what? I can see somebody watching this and saying, why, why are all of these kinds of programs inside prison? They were supposed to be there to be punished. Why should prisoners have access to things like this? Because I think that's a smart way to do that, because if not, it'll be either against each other or towards the correctional officers or both. I mean, it's already a very dangerous environment. So we have to be able to have something to be able to get guys focused on other things instead of on each other. So to do that, you got to have these programs to help people to understand where they come from, why they acted out the way they acted out, and what can get them to that place where they can be a decent human being again, you know, and find themselves and find their authentic selves to be able to be the uh, peaceful, productive, helpful human being that they always was meant to be. So without these programs and without this running community and without this running club, uh, I think society outside and inside of prison would be a very dangerous environment.
I'll add to that for a second because the, the data shows that 90% of the people who are in prison do eventually find their way out. So, you know, it's actually a matter of public safety uh, that we want to um, uh, have programs in prison uh, so that people won't recidivize. Uh, for the members that have gotten out, there is a 0% recidivism rate, which, you know, compared to the national average, I think in, in the U.S. after five years, it's 67%. So obviously the running program and a lot of these programs are, you know, it, it's doing something right. It's a step in the right direction. And, and it is a matter of national public safety that we do engage in rehabilitation programs. What do you think are the structural obstacles from implementing a program like this elsewhere? I think it really has to do with the culture of um, how we incarcerate people. You know, there's a obviously the culture of over-policing and the relationships between the administration and the population. Uh, and for that reason, that is why we are on a mission to go to different prisons, to screen the film, to have a plat that will create a platform for discussion, to meet with the administrations. So we are have received a lot of invitations. Uh, for example, like the state of North Dakota, uh, they let us know that the overwhelming majority of people who are locked up in that state are there due to drug-related uh, offenses. So the idea of, you know, replacing an addictive high with maybe a so-called runner's high is, um, uh, is what they're interested in. You know, we're yeah. not saying that running is going to solve the mass incarceration problem in this in this country. Okay, we don't want to oversimplify it. But what I do know is that when I did talk with a lot of the guys, they will say that when they can complete complete five miles, you know, suddenly they have this new confidence, they can then, oh, I can complete my GED. Oh, I can, you know, now I can deal with reconnecting with my family members. So it does set off a chain reaction of like positive behaviors. Markel, I know you served 18 years uh, for second degree murder. If it wasn't for these programs, if it wasn't for the Thousand Mile Club, if I just put you in prison, didn't give you any of these programs, uh, I don't know how many more years you would have had, but, and if you had come back out, what would be Markel Taylor then? versus the Markel Taylor that we're seeing today? My life, the way I was living, I was so mentally sick and distraught that I over and over and over again continue to punish myself, especially for the crime that I committed. So I could never forgive my own self because of my addiction to alcoholism, because I was masking my original pain and the things I was going through in my life, I was very sad and unhappy. And I was just making one bad decision after one bad decision because that's what I was, that's the way I, my, I was living my life. You know, I think without these programs and without the running club, I probably would still be in prison and I probably would have died by now. I probably wouldn't have made it. To be paroled in the state of California, one must prove transformation and have evidence of transformation. So if you don't have a pathway to prove transformation, such as getting an education, such as completing marathons, such as you know any of these health help groups, it's not gonna happen. But at the same time, for a lot of people, there are more opportunities that people have in prison than they ever had before on the streets. You know, mm -hmm. if they had those opportunities when they were kids, you know, would they have landed there? That's, that's the question. Uh, you know, I can tell you that most of the people that I talk with in prison, just anecdotally, you learn very quickly that all of the things that create success for people in life, access to education, some kind of financial means, some kind of mentorship or family structure. Most people in prison just don't have that. Obviously people did something to land themselves there, but you know, we as a society too are responsible for that. You know, would, would, would people be there if they did have access to education, if family structures were not broken because of multi-generational incarceration? That is also a big question. Hopefully uh, people can look at the film and, you know, these walls will turn into windows and people can take a look, a better look at life inside and what that really entails.
So, Markel, a couple of things. I mean, now that there are so many other people in prisons that might be seeing this film, what do you want them to take away from it? What I want is them to believe in themselves and to know that even if they're not accepted, that they are not the worst thing they've ever done. And that as long as they can strive towards a reality that they know that can fit them, like, and I'm going to give an example with running. As long as I know that I can maintain a seven-minute mile pace and train towards that and complete that, that's more realistic, then I can even achieve even higher goals if I put my mind to it and just never give up and just always believe that you are not your worst crime. I am not my life crime, and I am a wonderful, beautiful human being is what I would hope that they take out of that. And Markel, also, look, uh, I am <laughs> I'm an amateur runner compared to how you have not only qualified but finished the Boston Marathon. Can you tell me what it's like for you or what it was like for you to finish that race? The experience, my life running Boston, having an opportunity to do that was a very humbling appreciative situation for me to where I felt like a total sense of freedom and just just really, really, truly grateful to have the opportunities. What, what was it like when you crossed the finish line? I mean, what, what went through your head? I made it out of prison. That's all I can think about is I made it out of prison. I didn't even... It, things was just so fast for me at that time because it was just... <laughs> not even two months out of prison. It was like a month and some change when I got out. And it was like, man, and I'm crossing the finish line of Boston. It was like, it was so like, I couldn't even really understand it. It was just, I just was just thinking about just, I survived what I went through in prison and got out and had a second chance at life. The film is called 26.2 to Life, uh, filmmaker Christine New and Thousand Mile Club member, alumni, and marathoner Markel Taylor. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Thank you. This was a real honor.